thanks to the brothers and sisters in Kenya, you started massive protests, which protests spread to the entire world. That is the reason why I'm still alive. This is a Ugandan issue, and we should be holding this conference in Uganda. It's very unfortunate that we cannot be in Uganda. We, can mourn, we cannot mourn our people in Uganda. Kiza Besige, who has found himself on the wrong side of Museveni's regime, called on the East African community to call out the human rights injustices happening in Uganda. Violence, the waves of abuses have been going on and they are endless. And that's why, in fact, in our region, we must focus on Uganda. Because Uganda's abuses have also been internationalized. If we don't solve the problems in Uganda, this region will never settle. I think there is a recession of democracy all over the world, and Kenya is no exception. Vigilance is the price of democracy. The families of those who died in the security crackdown are yet to be compensated, despite Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, saying the government would compensate the victims. Opposition leaders and human rights activists have called out East Africa member states for what they term as silence in the face of human rights abuse. Mary Mwoki, Citizen TV. And straight on the back of that story, let's get some insights on the conference and the state of democracy in East Africa, Uganda and Kenya with my guest Robert Chagulani Sentamu, also known as Bobby Wine, who's here with us in studio. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for making time for us. And I immediately want to talk about the reason that you're here, the Uganda Human Rights Accountability Conference. Help us understand this. How difficult would it have been to host this conference in Uganda? Why Nairobi? Well, it's not just difficult, it's impossible because, uh, you know, human rights is something that is unheard of. As a matter of fact, there's a joke that the torture masters make uh, when they abduct, uh, abduct our people. The soldiers in those torture chambers, they say, we don't know human rights here, we know human left. That's the joke they have. So there's no human rights in Uganda. And... Uh, never mind that I'm an opposition leader, or that's where I'm relegated to, or Dr. Kizabesije. We can't be allowed to have a gathering, especially a gathering talking about human rights. Did, so, did you try to apply? Did, was there an attempt? Was there a discussion around trying to have it in Uganda first before choosing Nairobi? Well, we are largely seen as illegal citizens. You know, you don't have to ask because they will not allow you. Many times they've tear gassed, uh, disrupted our gatherings. So we thought for us to be able to communicate to Ugandans and the people of the world, um, we decided to come to Kenya, where we knew that there's at least a little bit of rule of law. But then if it can't take place in its jurisdiction in Uganda, how effective do you think the conference is in a completely different country? Uh, Uganda is under capture. Uganda is under gun rule, it's a military dictatorship. But we know that dictators don't only fall because of internal forces. You will remember that in 1979, Ugandans had to converge in Moshi, in what is known as the, the Moshi Conference, to base there to go back home and remove the dictatorship of Idi Amin. And the same, the same thing happens in the 80s. General Museveni and all those that he was working with mm -hmm. were worked through Kenya. So we look at Kenya as a safe haven for Democrats, especially we that are non-violent. What, what are you hoping to achieve? What are you hoping will be the outcome of this conference, which I believe concludes tomorrow? Um, we hope to achieve a lot of things, but most importantly, to create awareness, not only in Uganda, but in East Africa, in Africa and the world. We know that Uganda is not living in isolation. We are in what is purported to be the East African community. And we want the members of the East African community to know that the people of Uganda, and I believe the people of East Africa, don't want this East African community to be a club of presidents. We want uh, these leaders to be accountable to that. The atrocities that are ongoing uh, in Uganda, superintended over by General Museveni, have to be brought to the table. And we want to call upon other leaders that are passively supporting General Museveni and aiding him to do that. 
Uh, help me understand this, and as I listen to you tonight, and I'm sure viewers are, are watching us across the country and, and virtually online as well, some ask, what, what keeps you going? We followed your story, Bobby Wine, from when you were a, a musician to, to this path that you have taken, and very passionately at that. What, what keeps you going? Hope. Hope and history. Looking where we're coming from and looking in the future that keeps me going. How? Looking back, I know that no dictator has ever lived forever. No oppressed people have ever been oppressed forever. I know at the end of it all, always the people win. So that keeps us going, knowing that history shows us, and the further back we look, is the further in front we manage to see. We know that no dictator has ever won. And we have hope because so many people, especially young people, are awakened now. Back in the days when we were looking at our elders like Dr. Kiza Besige, not so many of us were politically conscious. I'm 40 today. But until I was 35, I was dancing the night and we are not looking beyond Friday night. But today, young people as early as 16, 17 are standing up to demand for their dignity, to demand for accountability, to demand for their rightful position, and to demand for their right to determine their own future. So the future is encouraging. Many young people are awakened now. If there's any time to be hopeful, it is now. Does that future include another presidential run for you? I, and together with my team, we're not looking at uh, just me running for president or me being president. I came into uh, the politics of my country not only to become president but to awaken as many people as possible. We have so many Ugandans Many of them even more talented and more knowledgeable mm -hmm. than myself. So what we want now is to push away a dictatorship so that at the end of the day, we have the right, we have our, our vote counts today, the vote doesn't count. What would be the purpose of running again for president when this time around I run and beat General Museveni hands down? To the extent that this time they did not rig, they just disregarded the results. You, and you're saying you beat? In, oh yeah, I beat General Museveni everywhere in the country. Your electoral commission uh, issued a completely different. Forget, forget that fraudulent electoral commission. And because I know you're a believer in rule of law, surely oh, yeah. you know they are the body mandated to announce who won the election. Oh yeah, but there was no legality in this case whatsoever. The every uh, legal tool was disregarded. Every law was disregarded. I'm sure you Kenyans watched the presidential campaign that we went through. I, I, I went I was into a campaign yeah, wearing a bulletproof vest and a ballistic helmet. This is uh, an election campaign, a presidential election campaign, where I was abducted on the day of my nomination. On the 30th of December 2020, my entire team was arrested. Many of them are still in prison today. Uh, on the 18th and 19th of November 2020, there was a massacre because I was illegally arrested and Ugandans protested peacefully. The military went on rampage and killed hundreds of people, although General Seven acknowledges only 54. And I want to clear, you mentioned uh, 24. He 54. And the regime acknowledges 54. But our human rights desk, you know, counts over 100 people, 100 cases of people killed. You know, we went to that election with the internet completely switched off, you know, with the military everywhere. All our election observers, all the, our election uh, managers and observers were rounded up and arrested. U.S. and European Union election observers did not show up. You cannot call that an election. But even with that, we managed to beat General Seven because according to the declaration of result, uh, forms that we got, we still beat him. Never mind that okay. he doctored them, we I, still beat him. It, it, it will be, it's your word against the Electoral Commission, uh, and of course we live in a world where uh, one, people are allowed to express themselves, but the rule of law is something I know you're very uh, keen on. I have many more questions for you. Allow us to take a short break and when we come back we get deeper into this. Thank Robert Chagulani, Sentamu, Bobby Wine, the leader of the National Unity Platform, live here in studio. We've got a lot to get through. The state of democracy, the state of Uganda's opposition, and so much more. We'll be coming back. And before I read a couple of news stories, Bobby, I was talking to you about your, your hope for the future and whether that would translate to a presidential run in 2026 and you said it's too early to talk about that but there are others 
who are talking about it. I'll, I'll read for you a tweet by the son of uh, President Museveni, General Muhozi Kainerugaba, who tweeted recently that to the Ugandan opposition, after my father, I will defeat you badly in any election. Ugandans love me more than they'll ever love you. So already the gauntlet has been thrown. Do you think in the next election, should you vie, that your opponent would be President Yueri Museveni, or it would be General Kainerugaba Muhozi? Like I said, I already beat Museveni. I already beat his father. Maybe if he wants a rerun. But that rerun has to be free, fair, and credible. For Muhozi, I hesitate to respond to him. Because I don't know his state of mind right now. Maybe if they will play the interview for him later when he's in his sober state of mind. But he also knows he cannot vote himself. As a member of the military, or uh, no, I mean, if if minus the, let me leave it at that. I, I, so you don't see him as a challenger in the next election. You don't. That's not something your team foresees. I mean, off the back of some of the statements he's been making, and, and I'm sure you've been following them. Definitely, you have uh, read the tweets by General Museveni's son, which, in my view, are largely a representation of his father's thoughts. Um, you know, what he tweets, in my view, is what they discuss on the dinner table, only that the son um, is let down by the drink and tweets it. Just like General Museveni, every once in a while, is let down by age, and, uh, unless they cut out of the bag, you know. However, among the many tweets, I remember he was telling you Kenyans that he does not believe in democracy or the rule of law. Now, why would I waste time? such an individual. Do you think he's being propped as a successor? Do you see a deliberate attempt but you see, by some in Uganda? Definitely. This is what dictators do all over the world. They don't trust anybody because they know nobody trusts them. General Museveni is trying to prop up his son. He's trying to turn Uganda into a monarchy. You know, that's how they normally do. And of course, if they're not resisted by the people, they always get their way. So if that is your feeling... Um, from where you sit, what does, what, what's your response then as the Ugandan opposition? Because from what we've seen from across the border, the Ugandan opposition seems fragmented, it seems divided. Whatever ambitions you may have or anyone else... That is a media narrative and I refuse to agree with it. Today, in Kenya, not even in Uganda, in Kenya, it was myself, Dr. Kiza Besije, Jeno Mujisha Muntu, and many other opposition leaders. By the way, I refuse to also be referred to as opposition. You'd rather call us the option. We won the election. And here the you dictionary, The dictionary defines opposition. The, exactly. Bobby. Yeah, but I mean, one Kenyan comedian was cracking a joke. And I agree with him that in Uganda they don't have an opposition leader. They have an athlete because he's always on the run. So <laughs> that's what we reduced to. Uh, we're relegated to the opposition, and I encouraged my team to take up that role and use it as a front fighting to end dictatorship. So please refer to us as the option, not as the opposition. Fair enough. That is, that is your right. You say the, the option is united. Yeah. But in 2021, when you were vying, we did not see that massive endorsement for your candidature from opposition leaders, so to speak. And some say maybe that has been the challenge of Uganda's opposition and Martha Karua challenged the opposition or the option yeah. to unite. Definitely, I agree with Mother Martha, and uh, I agree with you. We were not probably as united as we are now, or we are not as united as we should be. But I'll just quote for you, Malcolm X said, don't blame people for not thinking as you think, because there was a time when you didn't think the way you were thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't want to blame our disunity of yesteryear, Today, so how are you then new planning for are. the future? Is there a thought that Bobby Wine would endorse Bessie J or Bessie J would endorse Bobby Wine if it comes to but that? But the would problem that be a you are talking about a democratic election. You're talking about an election, and I'm telling you, what other ways are there to ascend to power in a democracy? But we're not living in a democracy. The question should be, what are the ways to get to power in a military dictatorship? And I'll tell you that Sudan was a military dictatorship. Bashir is no more. You know, uh, Burkina Faso was a military dictatorship under Blaise Kampoare. Blaise Kampoare is no more. Yes, they're having their challenges now. So, dictators 
are in most cases not voted out of power. Museveni supporters don't, but President Museveni supporters don't see it as you see it. They talk about a constitution, they talk about rule of law. Uh, they talk about, you know, President Museveni has, has previously told, uh, you know, media outlets that the opposition can operate as they feel in this in this country. So, which is why I ask you, you what are talking other about option? the constitution, my brother. <laughs> you know what has happened to our constitution multiple times. How many times it has been ripped and raped. You know, you've watched Ugandan politics. You saw what happened in 2005. General Museveni removed term limits. In 2018, he removed the, the age limit. And, uh, you know, this, and, and uh, they, they, there's a scheme in the offing to even scrap presidential elections. Why? Because General Museveni can no longer take the embarrassment of going into an election. I will also say this. How, how would that, sorry, I'm, I'm curious, curious about, how would that work? How would legitimacy be gained without... Way. Them. No, what, what are you hearing? Is it from MPs? Is it your MPs giving you this information? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you that uh, it always begins as an irresponsible MP making errant statements. And indeed, General Museveni uh, denies it, like he denied uh, the plot to change, to remove term limits, like he denied the plot to remove the age limit. That is how he recently denied the plot to remove presidential elections. But this is how he does it. General Museveni uses, uh, you know, leaders or MPs or politicians that seem unserious to test the waters. He'll bring something that will look clearly, clearly silly, but later on he's going to jump on it. So, like I was saying, today they are planning to remove presidential elections. I'll mention to you that I did not go into the election because I was expecting General Museveni's appointed electoral commission to declare me winner. I mean, this is the electoral commission that stopped me from uh, doing presidential uh, consultation. Even when it's within the law, it's the electoral commission under Mr. Yabakama who blocked me from campaigning when General Museveni was campaigning. We have an electoral commission that is led by Museveni's uh, former lawyer, a person that was used to I choose Dr. Besige of rep a few years ago. So that is the kind of democracy that we are talking about. But I was telling you uh, the many options that we have. You know, public within protest. The, within the law. Within the law. We are doing everything we do within the law. We mobilize within the law. We organize within the law. Mm -hmm. But even our legal organization is now declared illegal because it threatens General Museveni. So as you continue to speak at this conference, uh, both today and tomorrow, one of, the, one of the partners that I'm sure is attending are representatives of, of Western nations. Do you think the West should have a role in, in Uganda's politics? Yes. And ask how, me what role. How so? Yes. By stopping to sponsor impunity. By stopping sponsoring illegality. Dictators in Africa are largely funded by the West. General Idi Amin was funded by the West until they were tired of him. General Museveni receives a lot of money, up to a billion dollars annually. Is it him or it's the country? Do you mean? Don't but you mean Uganda. Uganda. Is, uh, the same Museveni, way Kenya receives money. Okay, or but General Museveni has yeah. reduced Uganda to his personal property. This is a kind of person that goes on national TV and says, "My oil." Okay, we are talking about General Museveni, and you know him. So let me, let me ask you this, because he mm. accuses you of being a puppet of the West. If anybody is, that is that a puppet of the West, the General Museveni is a puppet of the West. the West. The West does not pay me. The West pays General Museveni. The West protects General Museveni. The West turns a blind eye on the illegalities of General Museveni. You know, when Bashir did what General Museveni is doing, he was sanctioned. When Mugabe did to the people of Zimbabwe what General Museveni is doing, he was sanctioned. When all other dictators, the Saddam Hussein, ETC, did what Museveni is doing, they were sanctioned. Why is Museveni not sanctioned? You know, we attempted to believe that, you know, he is an agent of neocolonialism in Uganda. Today, we are being colonized by fellow black people. You meet ambassadors, you meet high ranking oh, yes. leaders as you go around the oh, world. Yes, you I pass do. this complaint. I tell them that straight. What, what do they India. tell you? What do they respond? Do, what do they tell you in response? Well, uh, I might not say everything that they say to me because some of them actually, off camera, they will agree with me. And others,
that are so embarrassed of what they are doing say we look into it, which clearly means we are not going to do anything about it. You've spoken about something you see in Uganda where a statement is made publicly by a leader. It's disowned by many, but later on things begin to unfold. And on the 8th of November, you tweeted, Dear Kenyans, be, be vigilant. Uh, this may come as a lone MP making a ridiculous suggestion, but this is how it starts. Uh, that's how schemes to remove term and age limits begin. Defend your constitution before it's too weak to defend you. Yeah. You saw that statement. For you, it, you, you what, did, what did you feel as, as you read what was a discussion in Kenya? When I saw that, two weeks. I saw Musevenism making inroads into Kenya. And that should scare you. Any sign of Musevenism is a dangerous sign. And I'll tell you, I respect Kenya. I don't intend to meddle into the issues of Kenya. But we are one and the same. These borders were drawn by colonialists. Our father, Kwame Nkrumah, told us that the liberation of Africa can only be real if we are all free. No country is free when their neighbors or when their brothers and sisters across the borders are not free. Dictatorships are the easiest things to export. I was concerned when... Uh, John Museven was referred to as a, uh, you know, uh, father of the region. But you know, yeah, we can respect age, but John Museven is respected by many for restoring peace, order in Uganda after the chaotic period. Uh, economic because people growth. that look at John Museven, yeah, those who see as, that as his enduring legacy. Well, um, I mean, everybody looks at it from their point of view some people look at it from a beneficial point of view i am a ugandan and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the majority of ugandans because we went to the polls and they gave me their mandate but i'm also speaking from the point of common sense because you know that when it starts like that you certainly see where it's ending you know so the the the, the reason why we go to school and i'll quote dr Bessige is to learn from the experiences of others. If you Kenyans cannot learn from the experiences of Ugandans, then it will be unfortunate for you to learn from your own experiences. In a nutshell... I told you to guard your constitution before it is too weak. To guard you, constitutions are supposed to be bigger than leaders, bigger than presidents, mm -hmm. you know. You have had the privilege of watching one leader peacefully hand over power to another leader. You don't want to lose that. You want leaders to be held accountable, for leaders to constantly be reminded that their term is going to expire and they will go off the presidency and others will come into power. And they, will, they should be reminded that they will be held accountable for the things they do while in power. You must not lose that, my brothers and sisters. When do you think uh, a transition like that will happen in Uganda. How soon? Where one president hands over to another, which I believe is something that has not been seen. That is something that my grandparents longed for. And then my parents longed for it. And now I'm longing for it. General Museveni took power when I was four years. I'm now 40. You know, Uganda has been independent for 60 years. General Museveni has taken 36 years of that and still counting. So for me, to be on this TV and tell you that on such and such a date is when we're going to have uh, a peaceful transfer of power, I would be lying to you. We still have to struggle to ensure that power leaves an individual's hand and goes back to the institution of state. The institutions are the ones that are going to be bigger than human greed. What was your assessment of Kenya's election? You were here as an observer with Dr. Kiza Besije and others a couple of days. I believe you landed here a couple of days before mm -hmm. uh, August 9th, and I don't know how long you stayed after that. What was your general assessment of our democracy here? Wow. I, what can I say? I was astonished. I go to the airport. The election was tomorrow. The internet was still on, and it continued to be on even through the election. I did not see uh, people being abducted or the military everywhere, you know. I did not see, um, you know, the opponents of the incumbent uh, under house arrest. It was astonishing. And I'm not saying Kenya's democracy is perfect, but I said it earlier on, that as imperfect as your democracy is, 
you are certainly where we envy. But again, democracy is always just a step away from extinction. So you must guard it jealously. A couple of years back, you made a, a radical decision to, uh, and you said uh, in your 30s, because you're now 40, mm -hmm. you know, your average Friday would have been you partying and, you know, entertaining uh, Kenya, Ugandans and the world. But you made a decision to get into the world of politics and, and activism as well. And what, what is your message? Uh, but before that, why did you decide to, to make that sacrifice of, of speaking up? Because many feel that there's a price you've paid for that. <laughs> I don't know if I will be understood if I say I didn't make that decision. The decision made me, you know, I... Something bigger than you? Yeah, I mean, I looked around and uh, there's nobody that could represent me like myself. You know, we have always looked out, up to the intellectuals of this world. Back in Uganda, intellectuals are the worst undoing to our country you know they are either scared or too satisfied they have too much to protect but we were many so i rose to the occasion to represent my people i started out as an activist and before long my friends around me were saying yo the things you tell us go tell them to us publicly and when i made that step man looking around masses were like yo you are the guy and said okay did you say i'm the guy all right i'm the guy I put on my suit and here we are how has your family been impacted by your political activities it has been a a big impact we've lost of course lots of comfort lots of privacy lots of freedom uh, my children have had to grow up much faster than their ages uh, my youngest child is uh, now seven, but she knows things that she probably would learn at 16. Uh, there's been a lot of discomfort, but I must also look at the positive. There's been a lot of love. We receive a lot of love from people, much as other families are suffering. And many times I even feel embarrassed. I feel we receive too much love because many other families are suffering, but we get love from people simply because of the decision that I made. I, I, I'm, I'm told we're due for a break just before that. What role does, would you say your family has played in this journey? You've talked about the impact, and specifically your wife, Barbara Chagulanyi. Uh, my wife has been a pillar of strength for me. She has, she's my first uh, advisor, and uh, you know, she takes me back in whatever shape I come back home, whether with broken limbs, beaten, etc. She takes me back. She agreed with me. She said, you know what? Go. She's, Go never, to she's never changed her mind and told you, stop this. It's too much now. Initially, she was not for this because we worked so hard in our earlier years and wanted to retire at 35, at least myself. So initially, she was like, man, you can still serve your country through your music. But when she came to see me in military detention, saw me beaten, watched my driver killed, watched women raped, she said, you know what, if it is you that we have to sacrifice for the liberation of this nation, so be it. And since then, she's harder than even myself. My goodness. Bobby Wine, hang on there. I need to take a short break, do one or two things, then I'm going to read feedback. We're getting so many messages, and I'm going to be reading that to you. Robert Chagulanyi, Sentamu, in the country for a conference, the Uganda Human Rights Accountability Conference, a 2021 presidential candidate. He says he has hope for the future, hope for Uganda. On that note, we take a short What would you say is Bobby Wine's political slash economic uh, philosophy that that could be something to consider for 2026, if you choose to buy. Uh, thank you. Like I constantly say, mm -hmm. pointing us to 2026 or pointing us to another election is in one way or another trying to cover up the mess. Okay, that away from the election, oh, what's your philosophy? Exactly. Number two, um, also asking us about policy. Policy is luxury for us. It's like asking somebody who has not had a meal for 10 days, whether they'll have nyamachoma or fish. We just want fish. I mean, we just want food. In Uganda, we are struggling to be free, to even be hard, because it doesn't matter 
what we want. You know, we've put all policy proposals uh, on the table. We've put um, uh, our, our manifest on the table and everything. But nothing matters. And not that those that have come to us have not brought uh, good proposals on the table. But here, what we have is a military dictatorship, a kleptocracy, which uses force to oppress people and rob them of everything. So that is where we are on that particular However, um, I mean, giving you a brief of our of our um, thought of a new. If guy. you were to describe it in thirty seconds, what would it? If be? we were to describe it in thirty seconds, mm. we would say we want an economy, an all-inclusive economy, an economy that serves the people. You know, we want to uh, change our priorities because we have a budget, however small it is. You know, to align it to things that benefit the people. We want to. Uh, refurbish our healthcare system, which is sick itself. Invest in our healthcare. You know, there have been proposals all, all over. Uh, talk about the, Mapo, the Maputo, the Maputo uh, proposal of, of uh, uh, upping the healthcare budget, mm -hmm. which is not the way it is back home. We want to revolutionize our education. For example, in our education, I gave uh, three A's which is arts, academics, and, uh, and uh, arts, academics, and uh, athletics. Yes, academics are good, but Uganda is most known because of athletics and arts. We want to take that to school, to know that not everybody is going to be an engineer or everybody is going to be a lawyer, but we want them to be productive citizens. I am a product of art. How about we have... We institutionalize the search for more Bobby Wines. You know, that's what we look at. We are looking at turning around the fortunes of Uganda. That would be your vision. That would be One of the things we've seen you tweeting about quite, quite a bit most recently mm -hmm. is about the number of Ugandans headed uh, to the Middle East, headed to Far East to look for job opportunities. Yes. And that is a very common situation here in Kenya as well, where a similar thing happens. You have worked to bring many back, I believe, yeah. as, uh, through your agitation and, and your human rights. Is it something you want to move to parli in your parliament with to, to have a look at how Ugandans are, you know, being taken for jobs abroad that, that don't turn out as they had anticipated, which is a problem we have yeah. here as well? The, the Ugandans going out to look for greener pastures is not their problem itself. That's just one of the symptoms. We have a country that works for a few you can have a job that is going to be reserved for so and so son or daughter to go and fit into that job. Some would argue we have a similar problem in Kenya. Well, you might have a similar problem. Ours is terrible, you know. At least in Kenya, it's not a government policy to sell off our girls and boys into slavery. I call it slavery because I know how they are treated. At least it's not a government policy to protect those that are dealing in crude businesses like organ sale where you will sell a human being thinking you're selling them into slavery and they are happy to go and slave, not knowing you're actually selling their organs. That's what's happening. Unfortunately, all these uh, companies are agencies. owned, all these agencies are owned by, <laughs> you know, state operatives or people that are in one way or another connected to the presidency. That is the tragedy of Uganda. So, you see our girls going... Many of them, at least on a daily, we have an average of five bodies repatriated back home. Now, those are the lucky ones. Many of them don't even have the ability to repatriate the bodies. So the challenge that we have, not just in Uganda, in Africa, is immense. However, in Uganda, General Museveni sees it as an advantage. First, he benefits because he gets uh, taxes from those agencies that sell our children into slavery. But also, he feels he, 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 the, his problem is being reduced because uh, unemployment among the youth is shooting through the roof. is way past 80%. How do you deal with that? You just send them to slavery and leave them there. We had, um, I, I, there are more than 20 detention centers in the UAE, and one of the detention centers I visited had 600 girls, 200 of them were Ugandans, 
Now, there are more than 20 detention centers across the UAE. These people, all they wanted was an air ticket, which is around 200 to come back home. To come back home. Mm -hmm. We have Air Uganda, which is seated there. The plane will be chartered to take one politician uh, to America for treatment. Or Museveni's daughter wants to go to Europe to give birth. But a plane cannot be chartered to bring back our people. Because according to General Museveni, they are nobodies. Well, we do have a similar problem here. And, and so I was, I was keen to hear your analysis of it because we also have many Kenyans out there crying that they are stuck. Uh, but I, I, do, I do hear you on that one. My last question to you, even as we wrap this up, is what sort of interactions would you say you've had with, with President Museveni face to face, either previously as a musician or when you got into, into politics? Well, or what were they like? The last time I met General Museveni, and spoke to him who's when I was an artist. I met him again in Makere University and I told him off. That was the last time. That was the last time? It was a uh, Nelson Mandela Memorial Lecture and uh, they were asking us to relate uh, Nelson Mandela and the youth of today. And uh, I put it on the table. I said, I wonder what uh, President Mandela and indeed General Seven would be thinking if they were young people today. Mandela is a guy that suffered so much, 27 years in prison, but when he became president, he did not see the need to have the sense of entitlement. He was president for only one term and left for the nation to move forward. General Museveni has been president for 37 years and does not want anybody else to take over the country. He believes he's the only human being with vision he believes Uganda will stop well, when his, he stops. His supporters support him through the party and, and they but would have, every, have a mean, different view. Robert Mugabe that. had similar <laughs> praise singers, you know. Even dictators have supporters. I want you to know that even Satan has supporters. Okay? People yeah, that you, feed from the hands of dictators mm -hmm. are always seeing their praises. You have, you have made your point. You spoke about the last time you saw him was when you were singing uh, in your earlier days. No, so the last time I had or one of the experiences. kind of uh, interaction. Is but if I was to meet him today, of course, uh, many proposals have been made to me, like they are made to many other people. But the kind of interaction, the kind of conversation General Museveni wants to have with me or with other uh, people fighting for change mm -hmm. in Uganda is how much do you want? What do you want? So you've been approached and you said no. Of course. Of course. Because I am not for sale. My freedom is not for sale. I don't want so much. I just want to be free. I want my dignity. I want my right to think for myself. And the same right and freedom I want for everybody in Uganda. Okay. Is music still something you do? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a music man. Music is me. Many of you knew me because of music. Most of uh, my messages, my most effective messages have gone out through music. Music is food to my soul and I believe music is a connector of me and many people out in the world. So yeah, I still sing. Of course, my music is abolished back home. It is banned. It cannot play on radio or TV. I cannot host any concert. Uh, you know, my concerts have been banned by the regime because they are scared of their music. But you're still recording your I still record my music. My music still goes out there. And I still communicate using my music. Well, I'm actually working on an album. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The album is called Forbidden Music. Coming out soon? Uh, you're the one that added uh, the word soon, but it's no, coming out sometime. With a question mark. Remove the question mark. Why, why, and it's forbidden because it can, you, 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 you can't play it in Uganda. Yeah, I mean... So that's the title you've, definitely, you've gone with. Yeah. One of my first questions to you was, what keeps you going? Maybe my last question should then be, how long do you think you can keep this up? How long do you see yourself in the space that you play in? No uh, matter who is in government. For as long as I live, I will be free deep in me. And I will strive and fight to be free outside of me. You know, I will want to be free. So I won't stop until I'm free. And even when I'm free, I will go even harder until everybody else is free.
that's how Bobby Wine sees it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. Bobby. Thank you for taking your time. I know it's a busy two days. Yeah. Conference today, conference tomorrow, mm -hmm. and then off somewhere else. Then off somewhere else. Thank you for making time for us. Robert Chagulani, Sentamu, live on Citizen TV in a wide-ranging interview. He's spoken on so many issues and he's wrapped up by telling us that he may have some new music out soon as well. Uh, and he believes in hope as that is what drives him moving forward. Thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in and watched this broadcast from the very start. Thank you, Thank Bobby Wine, once again for your time. And that's where we conclude the broadcast this evening. Thank you for your feedback. On our SMS line 22422, the hashtag has been tonight. Now, on behalf of the whole team that's made this broadcast possible, Asante Sana for watching us. Uh, my sign language interpreter this evening has been Wilson Mushora. We'll see you soon. Goodbye for now. Thank you for tuning in. Whichever part of the country or the world you've been watching us from. My name is Wahiga Mwaura. Good night. Thanks guys for watching. Thanks guys for watching. This is Elvis, Tim Chagulani TV, TK Media, TK Media Broadcasting LLC. Thank you, Elvis, once again. Bye bye.